And today I want to talk about not being offended by trouble. Matthew chapter 11, beginning in verse 1. When Jesus had finished his charge to his twelve disciples, he left there to teach and to preach in their Galilean cities. Now when John, who was in prison, heard about the activities of Christ, he sent a message by his disciples and asked him, Are you the one who was to come, or should we keep on expecting a different one? And Jesus replied to them, Go and report to John what you see and hear. The lame walk, lepers are cleansed by healing, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have the good news preached to them. And verse 6, And blessed, happy, fortunate to be envied is he who takes no offense at me and finds no cause for stumbling in or through me and is not hindered from seeing the truth. Now, let's just think about John for a minute. John had been faithful. He had a call from his mother's womb. He was the forerunner for Jesus' ministry. He was the one who was out in the wilderness crying out, prepare ye the way of the Lord, repent, and be baptized. John is in prison now. He's done the right thing. He's followed the will of God. To the best of his ability, he's done everything that he believes that God has asked him to do. He has sacrificed, he has suffered, he has been rejected and criticized. He lived out in the wilderness and ate locusts and honey and dressed in animal skins and everybody thought he was a raving lunatic. And now here he is sitting in this dirty, filthy prison cell. It's hard sometimes when you feel like you've done everything that you're supposed to do and your circumstances don't seem to be bearing witness to your faith in God. God doesn't always have the same plan for everybody. He sent angels to shake the prison doors and Peter was released. John, on the other hand, was beheaded. Uh-oh. Why, God, why? <laughs> when, God, when? Why me? Why did this happen to me? Well, I think that there's more of these few verses than what we probably pay attention to. Because John, who above anybody else should have recognized Jesus, sent a message, are you really the one that's to come? Or should we look for another? I think maybe there was a little bit of this in John's mind. Well, if you're really the one, then why am I sitting in here? If it's really you, then why haven't you done some miracle and gotten me out of here? And Jesus comes back and says, Blessed are those who are not offended at me. You know, we can talk about offense in a lot of different ways, but we have to also say a few words to people that are offended at God. I think sometimes we can be offended at God and not even know that we are. It just gets to be like this little bit of bitterness that gets in our soul, this little bit of resentment that's there because God hasn't done for us what we expected him to do because things didn't turn out the way we thought they should turn out. We saw somebody else get delivered like Peter did and we're still sitting here in our mess. Why, God, why, when, God, when? Now, I'm, I'm going to tell you this message today is not for the faint-hearted. If you're a shallow Christian, you are not going to be happy with my preaching today. You are going to have to make a decision today to either get in, get out, or get run over, one of the two. Because today we're leaving the shallows and we're heading for the deep. And you know, there's something really good about being in so deep that you're over your head. Once you're in that deep, it doesn't matter how much deeper you go. 
I've been over my head for so long, it just doesn't matter to me anymore. It's just like it's so easy to obey God because I'd drown anyway every day if he didn't help me, so. Go to John chapter 20, verse 24. Father, we thank you for this word today. And I believe it's going to change lives, not only in this place, but all over the world as it's shown by TV. You see, I have a passion. I want people to be radically in love with Jesus, not because of what he does for them, but for who he is. I said, I have a passion. I want to provoke you today <laughs> to be radically sold out, crazy in love with Jesus, and not because he does or doesn't do anything for you, but just because he is. And that's where we separate the shallow Christians from the deep Christians. Shallow Christians are always living in this little fleshly realm, the feel-good realm, the convenient realm. Got to have my miracle. If I don't have my breakthrough, Lord, I just can't hang on. Now, Lord, I'm just telling you, I can only put up with this about two or three more days, and then I'm, I just can't do this anymore. Well, just how dumb is that? You know, I'm not one of those kinds of Christians that, uh, you know, sees angels all the time. You know, I'm, I, haven't, I haven't visited heaven yet. I'm looking forward to it. But, you know, I'm not one of the ones that's been taken up there and sat down next to Jesus and had a three-hour conversation. And, I've read a lot of books about stuff like that and heard a lot of people's testimonies, but it hasn't happened to me. And um, one day I was complaining about that to God. <laughs> well, Lord, you know, I, that must be nice. <laughs> you know. I mean, if you just come sit down here on the side of my bed and talk to me for three hours like I've heard the, this other one particular book I was reading testify, you know, I guess it would be, you know, it'd probably spark up my faith too. And God just simply reminded me of these scriptures that I'm going to read to you, and that was really all he had to say about it. But if you want to know the truth, I've kind of lived on these scriptures for a long time, and I just think they're good ones. John 20, 24. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples kept telling him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see his hands the marks made by the nails, and unless I put my finger into the nail prints, and unless I put my hand into his side, I will not believe. There's a lot of people like that in the world, you know. Their faith is based on all the feel-good stuff. They've got faith as long as everything's working out for them, and as soon as things aren't working out for them anymore, faith goes bye-bye. Eight days later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them, and Jesus came, though they were behind closed doors. And I'll just mention here, I don't think he opened the door and came in. I think he just came in and stood among them and said, Peace be unto you. And then he said to Thomas, Okay, reach out your finger here. See my hands. Put your hand and place it in my side. Do not be faithless and incredulous, but stop your unbelief and believe. Jesus said to him in another translation, blessed are those who believe and have not seen. Blessed are those who believe <laughs> and have not seen. Can I tell you today, if you have not had your breakthrough and you are still really radically chasing after Jesus, you're blessed. If you've not been one of those people who have had a special trip into the spirit world and 
seen things and had Jesus come and sit down and have a conversation with you, but you've just been like for 30, 40 years just plugging along, believing God, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Just believe in God. Just believe in God. Just believe in God. You're blessed. You're blessed. And I would venture to say that you've got something nobody can take away from you. Because once you have that, I know that I know that I know that I know that I know. And I don't have to see it to know. And I don't have to feel it to know. I just know. Until you've been in the furnace and found the fourth man in there. All it is is a bunch of talk. Don't despise your hard times. They do more for you than you can possibly imagine. And don't be offended by trouble. Because even though you don't know what God's doing, God knows what he's doing. Did you hear me? Even though you don't know what God's doing, God knows what he's doing. John 13, verse 7. Jesus said to him, you do not understand now what I am doing, but you will understand later on. That's a promise for everybody. How many of you got some stuff going on in your life right now you don't understand? <laughs> well, then this is for you today. We've pulled this right out of the Bible here just for you today. You don't understand right now what I'm doing, but later on, you will understand. And you know what? Even if you never totally understand it mentally, you'll see the results of going through with God. Because you get something when you go through with God that you just can't get anywhere else. Mark chapter 4. Verse 14, the sower sows the word. The ones along the path are those who have the word sown in their heart. But when they hear, Satan comes at once and by force takes it away. And in the same way, the ones sown upon stony ground are those who, when they hear the word, at once receive and accept and welcome it with joy. But they have no real root in themselves. And so they endure for a little while. Then when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, they immediately are offended and become displeased and indignant, resentful, and they stumble and fall away. Now remember the word offense comes from a Greek word that means a bait that hung on a trap that lured animals in. It also means to stumble and to fall away. Jesus said that he became a stumbling stone to many. That when they came to, to his message and they were confronted with his truth, they couldn't take it anymore. And they stumbled and they fell away. And I believe that Christians are going to have to make their mind up where they stand and I think that, that you better figure out whether you love God for what he's doing for you or whether you just love him because, who he, because of who he is. And I'm not prophesying a bunch of doom and gloom and oh, everybody's going to go through horrible times. I believe God's going to take care of us. But let me tell you something. Everybody has trouble in their lives. But not everybody sticks with God when they have trouble. Not everybody keeps praising God when they have trouble. Not everybody keeps their commitments at church when they have trouble. Not everybody keeps on tithing when they have trouble. Not everybody continues to reach out to other people when they have trouble. A lot of people just go sit in a corner somewhere and nurse their wounds. Feel sorry for themselves and get critical. And they become like the Israelites who wandered 40 years in the wilderness. Every time things aren't comfortable, they blame God and everybody else around them. I'll never forget this one man, and I, I tell this frequently, but it's so good. His son had cancer, and he was believing God for his miracle, just like all of us would. However, the boy died, and the man became very bitter toward God. And one day, he was actually kind of 
screaming at God, God, where were you when my son died? And the Lord answered him back and said, the same place I was when mine died. Now, I'm, I'm going to say just a couple things to you today that you may just have to tuck away somewhere and see how you feel about them as time goes by. But just like Jesus died for us sacrificially, paid a price for our freedom, I believe that there are individuals that are called to different levels of sacrifice in their life for different reasons. I think that in my own case, that I can see that as I look back at my life. I was sexually abused in my childhood for many, many, many years, about 15 years. Not once or twice, but repeatedly. A whole bunch of ugly stuff that I don't even need to get into this morning. But I was born again when I was nine years old, and in the midst of that mess, I was praying all the time for God to get me out of it. But he didn't. It continued, week after week, year after year. Why, God, why? When, God, when? I mean, I prayed for the person that was abusing me to die. I, you know, I mean, it was, my, it was my father. I can happily say that he went home to be with the Lord. He was born again about three or four years ago, and so that's great. For the first time in his life, now he's probably happy, and I'm happy for him. Well, you know, God didn't get me out of it, but I'll tell you what he did do. He gave me the strength to go through it. Now, you're not listening to me yet. God did not get me out of it, but he gave me the strength to go through it. And now, you know, there are other people that, that get delivered. I mean... The angels came and shook the prison doors, and Peter had a miracle. <laughs> I bet that was awesome. Sitting there in chains and, the chains, and the angel comes and shakes the doors, and the chains fall off, and everybody falls back, and everybody gets saved. Wow, what a meeting. Not John, man. He gets his head cut off. Now, I know you'd all like to be Peter today and not John. But I'm just saying that we don't always get to choose which path God's going to lead us down. But we do need to trust him that whatever path it is, he has a reason. And even though we don't understand now, we will understand later. And what our job is, is to trust him completely, wholly, 100% to trust God. Well, you know, I didn't understand all that stuff and why God didn't help me and all the stuff that I went through and, you know, on and on and on and on and on. But you know what? I look back now and I believe that's part of the reason why I can help people. You know, I, I mean, I help a lot of people that have been abused. Just standing here saying that I was abused gives people hope that if I can overcome, they can overcome. Now, I was in that situation. I received Christ when I was nine years old. I don't even know how I knew I needed to get saved, but God knew that I needed to, and he put that in me, and nobody was taking me to church, so I snuck off with some relatives to church and went to the pastor at the end of the meeting who forgot to have an altar call that night, tears running down my face, and said, can you save me? The thing that I think is interesting is I took two of my cousins with me, and I said, we're going to get saved tonight. So I think the call was there even way back then. Now, I prayed for God to get me out, but instead of getting me out, he said, I'm going to take you through because I've got a plan for you to use you to help other people. I believe that some people have to go through some things for somebody else's sake. Is anybody awake today? Now, I could have gotten mad, and I could have gotten offended at God, and I could have said, well, I don't understand, and, you know, if you don't love me any more than that, then just forget the whole thing, and a lot of people do that. They get offended by their trouble. 
All they think about is how they feel, and the whole thing becomes what about me again. It's not about God and his plan and what he wants to do, but it's about them. Let me tell you something. I'm not anybody to be pitied. God has more than made up to me for anything that I did not get in the early years of my life. I mean, good night. I stood over here when our conference news was running, and I'm just standing there, me and Chris, the guy that helps me, and oh, by the way, she's on television all over the world in 25 languages, and I turned to Chris and I said, you know what? We just get so used to this. We just, we don't get it. I said, did you hear that? He said, I was just thinking the same thing. Miss Nobody from nowhere abused in her childhood. <laughs> wow. Wow. Man. You know, Frida Lindsay was here last night. She's 92 years old and still preaching. And and Chris said, you said last night that you hope you're still preaching when you're 92. And he said, if you are, I hope I'm still working for you. <laughs> That's the kind of people you want hanging out with you, amen? Man. God is so faithful. And he says, I'll give you double for your trouble. I'll give you recompense. I'll give you reward. I'm your vindicator. I'll make it up to you. Why don't you stop worrying about what God is not doing for you right now and look forward to what he promises he's going to do before it's all over. I love the scriptures in Acts. I think it's either chapter 7 or I think it's Acts chapter 7 verse 9 where it says, And Joseph's brothers hated him. And they hated him all the more, but God was with him and gave him favor everywhere that he went. You see, it just doesn't matter who's against you if God is for you. And if you want to know the absolute truth, it really doesn't matter that much if you're in the furnace or out of the furnace as long as God is with you. Yeah. Did you hear what I said? Yeah. I said it really doesn't matter if you're in the furnace or out of the furnace. The thing that matters is do you have God's presence in your life? Yeah. Do you know him? Do you have fellowship with him? That's the thing that really matters. We get all too caught up in what's going on and what's not going on and God, why aren't you doing this for me like you did it for them and I don't understand why God, why, when God, when. You know, it's time to leave the shallow level of living, which is living in how we feel and what we think and what we want and head for some deeper places in God. You know, if you're a Christian, if you've received Christ as your Savior, then God lives in the deepest part of your being. And I believe that faith is in there because the Bible says that He gives a measure of faith to every man. But sometimes we have to dig a little bit deeper to walk in faith when our circumstances seem to be dictating something else.